Hey, what's going on? It's your boy Joe Thunder back once again with another episode of the Smoking Joe Thunder podcast. I got my co host Elvis Freshly in the building. Yo, what's going on, man? Chilling, bro. I got a one home. One home. How you doing, man? Yeah, nah, we ain't did that a minute, minute, right, man? Forgot about that. We got a guest like we ain't seen it. I ain't seen it forever, man. So we got to bring back that. Oh, bring it back some There you go. There yeah, you go. Yeah. Real quick, shout out to Be Good, our official sponsor up there on 11 West Hampton. Where are they up up north? 114th. And Cherokee Street, right across the highway from Boondocks. Boondocks. We Google got, that shit. Yeah, Google Google that shit. We got Juan on the video. We got Big Crook with us. But we got another banger for you today, man. We got a motherfucking... Man, if you... He's definitely on the Mount Rushmore of MCs, ah. lyricists, cats, and that kind of caliber, bro. No, definitely. Ah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, okay. Denver icon for sure. Ah. You know? For real, bro. You've been a, I mean, Honestly, you've been, you an icon know? here for it's sure. Local? Somebody who... Nah, I guess not. You know? I guess not. Made it out, so yeah, definitely done, you know? done more than the local scene. I guess not. But we've been waiting for this cat for a while, man. Yeah. You probably ain't going to see him on too much shit, but you're going to see him here on the Smoke and Joe Thunder podcast. You will. You know, he was down with the crew called Life. Mm-hmm. He's down with a group called Pirate Signal. Mm-hmm. He's down with a group called the Black Hearts. Mm-hmm. And now he's doing his thizzle. And we got motherfucking Jonas in the building. Yo, yo, yo. <laughs> yo. <laughs> Yo, how you doing, bro? Chilling, bro. What's up? What's up? It's good to see you. It's just been a minute to be in the legendary spot. I don't see many interviews in here, so it's an honor to be in here. We're we're creeping up on like two, three. I'll say two, three hundred. Like I know we're somewhere in there. Two fifty at least. You gotta be, bro. I think we're even beyond that. We lost count, bro. Yeah, but no, we definitely appreciate you coming by, man. You know, you got some new music. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Finally, after it's been eight years. Eight years. Or you yeah. take a hiatus, huh? Wow. I did. I did something like that. I got to get right. Wow. You know Why'd I mean? you take the hiatus, bro? What happened? You know, I think uh, a lot of unsustainable life practices right. that I had okay. to recalibrate so that I could. Because I think part of the thing about creativity is you get deluded into thinking a lot of certain things might be lubricants mm-hmm. to creativity, but in reality, they're hindrances. Right. And then you develop these crutches, these dependencies, mm-hmm. and it sort of distorts your relationship with music itself. And you're you're kind of like hitting on like, why do you art sober? Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The the, uh, the influences are gonna make it better, right? It's gonna make it more. Yeah, yeah. That theory, that that you know that I mean? belief system, and then right. you said just, fools get caught up in that shit. It's huh? increasing. I mean, I think there's sustainable stuff like smoking. Yeah. You know what I mean? Maybe a little drinking or whatever. But you start ratcheting it up. Right. I'm gonna start including Having pharmaceuticals yeah. or whatever. But and even then, the drinking alone, be having it could motherfuckers kill you, yeah. wanting to. Nah, yeah, it, and, and it does. It's, it's one of the main, you know, reasons people are dying out here. But but nah, it also real. is the gateway for real, for real. That's why yeah, motherfuckers nah. do want to do bumps, want to do the most. Yeah, yeah. Some yeah. Smoking weed, you just end up smoking more weed and shit, eating a lot of junk food. Yeah, exactly. I was always more of a drug man myself, though. I was never much of a drinker, you know what I mean? Uh-huh. But yeah. with that, I just felt like I just kept ratcheting intensity. Because, you know, like, nobody wants to talk about this, but around the time when we was first met, like, mm-hmm. 06, 07, indie rap had a opiate problem. Right. Had an Oxycontin oh, yeah. problem. Right. You know what I mean? And it was run rampant throughout the scene. Where and you know what's crazy, too, is when you're someone of your caliber and your talent, you literally have people that are just trying to be down with you giving it to you. Yes. Yes. Like here, bro. Yes. Boom. Yes. 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 And that was knock yourself out. That was right. definitely the that's the trap gateway. That's the yeah. trap. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because they're just trying to be cool, and they think they're doing a cool thing, but in reality, like, there's really some sucker shit. That's how they love, though. Yeah. That's how, that's a, that's how they know to love. Right. That's loving them. Right. You know what I mean? Everybody's sick. But like, I think part of the thing was like. I was always like, oh, let me do this, and then go make music. Then right. go make music. Then go make music. You know what I mean? I wasn't like out in the streets running up to be wild. Nah. Just whatever they gave me, I went to the studio, bang stuff out. But nonetheless, I mean, it's like, I think somewhere along the line, you're like, I can't even do this without. You right. Know what I mean? And then it's like, oh, I got to I gotta relearn everything. Right. I got to reconnect. Because, you know, I think that was the main thing was like, why do I even do this anymore? Why am I even making music, you know, and mm-hmm. having to figure did you, that out? Did you lose that love and feeling for a while? Uh, yeah, I would say not so much lost love and feeling in terms of loving music itself, mm-hmm. but why was I making music? Right. What? What? Because I think even with this newer music, you know, I mean, like part of it was I really was getting into singing, getting into all these different vocal styles and shit, but just felt this obligation to do rap, you know, and mm-hmm. just that conflict 
made it to where it's like, I don't want to rap, but I feel right. like I have to. And so it's like, you know, so I remember I would have for years, I had songs that I'd have the hook and the verse would just be open for years. Cause I just, right. I don't want to do this. You know what I mean? So like, even just that decision, like fuck with everybody, or fuck with everybody. You, you know? feel you were like forced into it by like the fans and shit like that? No, I feel like just the culture I grew up in. Right. Because I feel like we grew up in a time where rapping and singing were just like, you right. know what I mean? There's Lauren Hill, maybe, but even she, she's a woman. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like there definitely wasn't that like in the space. So I feel like growing up around, the, you know what I mean? You know, life crew, all these, you know what I mean? Motherfuckers is not receptive yeah. to that shit. Right. <laughs> I feel like that's right. kind of was, I feel that that's kind of like Denver sound, like that kind of Drake singing now, rap. You now, know what that's mean? what I'm saying. Even Our back in the day, like remember doing stuff with B Black and they were, and even, you know what I mean? Yeah, you B know, Black other cats was, changing their shit up all the time, not being just 16 bars. You mm -hmm. feel me? Mm -hmm. nah, switching it up. I feel like B Black was somebody... OG on that singing and rapping shit, but like I feel like in my space, like particularly like right. hip hop, that, that backpacky type yeah. of underground shit. shit. Out of here, yeah. I don't, I don't like, know if you yo, lyrical, ventriloquial, yeah. dilical. Get that shit out of here. Dude. I don't know if you remember, you just... but he had a song that he did with Decca on Decca's album yeah. that was called Changes, which was fucking fire. Yeah, bro. Like, I remember when the sickest songs like that hook on there just had, you know what I mean? Like, like damn, like he's nice. He's nice. Uh, he shit's nice. changed, you yeah, know? Yeah. I mean, I think for me it was like. I'm not naturally a good singer or anything like that. You know, definitely some. I just wanted to sing. So I kept singing, kept singing, kept singing, kept singing. But I felt like we came up in a time where it's like, you know, you either blowing it down like a real singer, you know what I mean? But now we live in a time where it's like the, all the singers we know, nobody's like actually a good singer. They just got auto-tune yeah, yeah, melodies. Yeah, you you know just got to have a cool little, cool rhythm, little vibe. Little thing. You know what I mean? But I think that for me personally, I was like until I was alone. Until I didn't have a social element in music where it was me alone in a room. I didn't have niggas to go, check this shit out, yeah. check this shit out. That's when I started You're able to express yourself. Yeah, that's when I was like, oh, I want to do this. I wanna... And that's part of the reconnection process. Because I feel like, like, you remember Nate? Nathan yeah. Thornton? Schmees? That's probably the same. R.I.P., right? R.I.P., bro. Yeah, he's the only one, dog. He gave me a diss, that wheelchair shit. And it literally, I want to, I'm I always exaggerating my numbers, but it had like 10 diss in it. Like, that's yeah. seven diss. Yeah. It was a fucking yeah. book with like a yeah. million songs. Yeah. I was like, damn. Yeah, yeah. And you did like 99 <laughs> songs. Fucking Cause he just beats, would right? steal all my beats and rap on those. Yeah. <laughs> so he, I'd, I'd push it out. And he'd be like, oh, yeah, I put some on that beat up. too. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Like, that's how I got a triple disc. <laughs> that's half my shit. Let's but um, that nigga was my main musical acolyte. You know what I mean? Like huh. everything I did, check this out, check this out, check this out. He was His your go to influence. So, like, that was the loudest voice. Like, don't fucking sing. I'm tired of singing. Where the bars at? Where the bars uh. at? But what's ill is that basically the whole studio I got right now, he had bought it right before he passed. Uh -huh. And. I was gonna help him with his album, and then I was gonna be able to do mine. And he passed, and then his mom, after a while, she gave me the studio. But I remember I would go up and try to record in that room that he passed in uh -huh. for the studio. He fell, he died in that room. Oh man! And I tried oh, to go shit. up and record there, and I remember, even though he's dead, I'm like, I got a rap for this nigga, bro. Right? You can't sing. I, mean? yeah. I can't. Uh... This nigga dead, bro. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. So like that was mad liberating though when I find so I had so finally I took it out of his space and mm -hmm. brought it home, and I remember I was working on that macaroni song. Okay. And I was singing it, and then when it drops, there was a verse, and I just kept trying to fit rap verses in there, and I showed it to my my friend Morgan, who's on the album too. She talks on the album, mm -hmm. and she was like, "Yo, this sound like two songs," and I was like, Pow. "What? Why does it sound like two songs? Cause cause why are you rapping, bro? Like just." And Finish then it after all that, same way. Touch. Changed my whole shit up. Damn. And that was a re major reconnection point for me. You know what hey, I mean? how'd you actually end up meeting him? How'd you guys connect? Did you guys Nate? go to high school? Yeah. Back in, there was a spot we all used to kick out after high school uh, in college called 1520 Holly. It was the homies crib. Mm -hmm. Fucking. Like the Ogden house, no? Low key. It was a crib. Yeah, yeah. like the Ogden house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, this, my homies, Pat, Gora. Nico, a lot of people lived there, but we all used to go kick there, and they used to throw these sweater and eggnog parties for Christmas. <laughs> all right, all and right. that's how I met him. I was 18, he was 18, and I was like, I remember I was like, yo, what's your name, blah, 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 I get to talking, and I was, that's when I was mad brash. I was like, I'm the train out of Denver. Hop on. <laughs> I told 
that nigga. That's that. hilarious. But that impressed him. You know what I mean? And we just became best friends after that. Oh, uh, yeah, that's dope, man. You know what I mean? Because I, I remember looking at that, I remember him telling me, like, yeah, Jonas produced everything. I was like, just three discs, bro. Like, <laughs> uh, like for real? He was, wow. I mean, I'll I tell you something about get reconnecting. He was a major part, too, because I remember I was living in L.A., you mm-hmm. know, and then when I came home, because basically everything fell apart, I was really off the music shit, and I needed bread bad, though. And he was like, oh, you need bread? Make me beats. Exactly, yeah. You know what I mean? And I was like, fuck. But that's how I got back into making beats, because I needed that bag. You know what I mean? And so, like, but I knew he knew what he was doing. You know yeah, what he mean? had a big plan. Yeah, and I think that's why he bought the studio. That's why, because even if he didn't love the direction I was going in, which I had been going in for a long time, he was still supportive. You know what right. I mean? And he, he would rather me do that than not do nothing, you know? Right, right. So, like, even with this album, like, you know, the whole album is singing, the whole album is no bars or whatever, but it's still dedicated to him because I couldn't have done it without him. He gave oh, me yeah. the studio, you know what I mean? And he just, you know, it's been like almost four years, five years. It's just like, I know. Dog, be flying, bro. Every day I think about it, you know what I mean? And I just be like, like even the bio to the album on Apple and Spotify is a letter to him, mm-hmm. like apologizing about the fact that I took your studio and I made this album with no bars, but thank you. I love you. I apologize. Please forgive me. You know what I mean? You're funny, fool. Because, like, no. it's weird how that works, how, like, even though a nigga's not around, you factor him into your decisions. Yeah. You know I mean, you want to do right by it. It's like Pimp talking to Pac, bro. You know, you know what, what I mean? mean? Looking at the fucking, I do the same. I got a little fucking Tupac shit, some full semi from Europe. Sometimes I'll be sitting there like, man, what'd you do, bro? <laughs> Like you say, fuck those bitches. And I'm just like, for real, though. for real, though. And you like well, even Pac like did. I find myself laughing like Schmitz. Like he used to go like, uh, uh, yeah, do that uh, little beat uh. some butt and uh. And now I do that like on my own, not trying to bite it. Like literally, <laughs> right? right it's, it, it's in me, you know what I mean? And so yeah, you I, spend enough time with somebody, you pick up traits and but and I didn't do it until after we passed. Right? I didn't, uh, uh, yeah. uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I'd be doing that. Shit. It's so <laughs> funny though. I'd be like, and I hear it, and I'd be like, damn, there he is. Right. Yeah, you know I mean, that's coming back. Just uh, looking out for you, bro. Bro, I love that dude so much. You know what I mean? And I think part of this whole process was like, okay, man, I gotta do this, bro. You're not around no more. You know what I mean? I gotta do it, bro. And that's like, a, just, just be happy for you. Give me your blessing from up there or wherever. You know? For real, I need right. that. And he stayed right down the block. I want to say like we were there on like Detroit, like in Colfax. I remember. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? He was all in the hood, bro. He was like he would live across the street from where I live now. He lived across the street from mad places where I lived. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Oh, Nate used to have an apartment there. Oh, <laughs> Nate used to have an apartment there. So uh, let me ask you about Life Crew though. How did you hook up with Life Crew? Um, How did all that happen? Well, you know, Decca's. Yeah. yeah, I've known Decca's since. He was in third grade. I was in fourth grade. All right, because y'all both in Park Hill. Yeah. All right. So um, we weren't super close in middle school or in high school, but near the end of high school, when I started to get super duper into hip hop, really, at East in Park Hill, it was, it was Decca, Ichiban. Right. They were knee deep in it, already doing graph, all that shit. So, you know, if you're going to get involved and you're from Park Hill, you're going to have to deal with them. You know what I mean? So... At that point, it was like I definitely reached out, or we just started crossing paths, freestyling all the time, and then me and Decca especially just clicked up. Right. And so then Decca at some point met Maine, and he just kept telling him, he was like, yo, I've been fucking with these dudes, blah, 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 you gotta come meet him, blah, blah, blah. And then when I did eventually meet him, um, we know we clicked up, and they were like, yeah, you gotta join, you know, you gotta be, you should be part of Life Crew or whatever. But right. Life Crew was storied. You know what I mean? They had been around because they were part graph. Right. You know what I mean? They're like a hip hop. They're like, I want to say, like probably the original hip hop crew in Denver. Like Low-key. everyone. An institution. I mean, as far as actually getting into music, too. Because yeah. I feel like other yeah. crews were strictly graph. And like really doing it, though. Like mm-hmm. even like having dope shows and parties and mm-hmm. events and mm-hmm. like really cool mm-hmm. shit popping. You know, it wasn't mm-hmm. just like other fools were like, all right, we're going to throw a party at my grandma's crib and like whatever. You know what I mean? It yeah. was like. Dope. I remember being going to like Revoluciones and like yeah, all these places back in the day. Yep. It was like, yo, there was a whole event. They had like, it wasn't at someone's fucking in someone's backyard. It was. Remember Ideal Ideologies? Yeah. That was main and, and, and theme. Yep. And they had this so uh, Pucker Up, Buttercup. I remember that. <laughs> Me and Nate, Nate, used, Nate was on up on them. And right. he was like, shoot this. And he, I love it when that nigga say Pucker Up, Buttercup, all this shit. You know what I mean? 
So it was definitely some shit where it was like, uh, I'd heard of them, mm -hmm. and I think really the entirety of my community with hip hop had been the people I'd grown up with. But that was the first group of people who weren't people I'd grown up with. They right, were just outside, doing it. yeah. They were from another part of the town, yeah. and they like welcomed me with open arms. And I remember very quickly, then she started cracking. We was in Westward. Uh, you know what I mean? They, I remember the film they, mode shit at the Bluebird. Film mode. Yeah, I was just about to say that. Yeah, that, that was, was the shit. That was the shit. That, that was, was a legendary shit. moment because we packed out the Bluebird. You know what I mean? Yeah. I remember that. I remember I remember even people from the hood, from Park Hill, had came and they were like, damn, you big time now. And Would I you say there's people, from every, there's <laughs> yeah. people from every Everywhere, hood. Everywhere, yes. From every hood that yes. showed up for that shit. Yes. That was the coolest part of it. And because... It was the only place you've seen people come from every hood, and people weren't, not only were they not hating on each other, they were like, what up? Mm -hmm. Or like, oh, you're so-and-so. Mm -hmm. Like, it was a whole different vibe. It was hip-hop. It wasn't hood shit. Where it wasn't I was like, graffiti. It wasn't was like, rap. It was everything. Right, it wasn't neither. It was both. And and notoriously, prior to that, it was always like some hood, some gang shit. Some if gang, that, if fight, that kind yeah. of shit went down, Fuck yeah. it was like, we're going to fight after or before or whatever, and that was a whole... Different that vibe. was the thing I'm yeah so it was like that was that one of those first integrations across town right groups crews you know that's what I mean? kind of one of the first things that I Definitely. went to really I remember like mm -hmm. real early like starting to get into things and it was like right down the block from where I, I still lived on Detroit what year was that you know what I mean it had to be like oh one oh two bro. Yeah, yeah like that uh, oh four yeah. maybe no nah, I was like oh I would two, say oh, I would say oh four maybe oh three oh maybe. three I don't know I don't know if that album came out yet. The one you talked about. Right, right, right. I right, think right. it might it have actually. Yet. I don't know. That's what I'm saying. It was just such a primordial time. I don't think time. so. Because it was for me, that was a whole different. That was film mode was, you yeah. know, that. No, that was, but that was, that was that was the life thing. Yeah, like I was working at AT and T back then. That was a long fucking time ago. Yeah, like, no, it I was in high school. I actually listened to those songs too. Like, oh, that, that I fucking that worked with. Do you yeah. have that? That life crew compilation? Oh, I do not have that one. I that was to what I was trying George. to hear from you. Uh, I was just telling you. No, about. no, you know, but Black Boy Jungle was on Decca's album, but that shit had some joints, like for instance, like posse cuts. Some kind of like it was a, it was like a life crew sampler, but I had two songs on there. One was called The Beast, and then was called Slow Down. That were like, it was after that album, but it was like the first time I was doing songs that weren't like crazy multi part epics. It was just right. like a beat and. Some, First time I was singing on Hooks too. <laughs> was oh, that no song? Shit. Yeah, the Beast. I remember on that Life Crew compilation. And them niggas was cool about that shit. But I even remember like back then. I remember like for instance, Jolt was like, "What is this singing shit, bro? This beat is way too hard for you to be doing that." So like even then, it was <laughs> oh, just shit. like that cacophony. But that was definitely. I give it up to Maine because I feel like he was really the center, the linchpin yeah. of that cultural community right. yeah. thing. That sort of like. Bridge the gap between the really primitive periods of Denver hip hop, of like what we talking about when everything was just very provincial and crew like and shit, to right. where there were these uh, get togethers and celebrations. Like because after that, then you start to see shit like Colorado Crush. And, right, right. Yeah, you know I mean all that type but of shit. Yeah, you're right. Maine did do. Maine, he, yeah. he he really made the scene. Yes. Uh, 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 come together. It was it was a whole different vibe. Mm -hmm. it became a different vibe in hip hop and in, in Denver and what. Cats were doing, and I really, I gotta give it to him. Give too, it to you him. Know? And yeah. even like on our level, we did the same shit. Yeah. By introducing Jewel Time and Fo. That's to yes, what them. you did. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Black yeah. Hearts, you was that, that dude, shit. like right. you know who was really bridging the towns in terms of like Aurora and Denver. You was bridging Montbello and Denver. Bridging. And Hood Cats, though. And too. Hood Cats were like never doing shit with Dude, any of these other cats yes, too that's yes. one of my claim to fame is for yeah. the B-Black Decca mixtape that me and Sam did like 10 tracks that shit took forever to get done yeah that was supposed to be like the third mixtape or whatever yeah. fourth one yeah. end up being like the eighth cause Decca was hard to get a hold of sometimes but I mean that shit when you listen to it it's like some different shit bro but that's what I was saying you was even doing that you had a you had a studio in your crib you was making rappers come through make tapes just to canonical you know what I mean yeah. like this is the this is the city you know what mm -hmm. I mean it's like you treated it like it was important like I, said, I remember me right. and you had like when sessions nobody else it. was and like when everyone nobody else, else did everyone else was like this is what you're doing now this isn't important this isn't tight this isn't national Fuck no. like like and every, that's everybody else's feeling and no, you for gave real. it you gave it a real feel and a real importance and there was other people that felt that way too but you documented it that's you why held it it was important know? to me to do this right first you know what I mean like cause I'm gonna go out I'm gonna do hella podcasts yeah. and shit but like to me, it was I was always like in the back of my brain. When I come back, I'm gonna hit Joe first. 
I appreciate because that. Because to me, like, you the first dude I remember who wasn't an active participant in terms of, like, you're not a rapper. Right. You're not, but you you documented and you care. You mm-hmm. care as if you was a rapper. You care as if you was an artist. You was bringing right. people together to where, like, bro, your collection of between all that and this mm. is going to be one of the definitive Denver hip hop. Thing, you know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah. like when it's people be, be like, historian, yeah, historian. You know what I'm saying, like, long after you pass, bro. You know what I mean? Like, like, yep. and I think that that's like to me, if if I'm gonna treat my work like it's important, uh-huh. I gotta treat the community I came from like important. I gotta treat our oracles, our receptors, right. our our journalists, our community, our culture. I gotta prioritize them first because I think the reality is like your work reminded me what I was doing was important. Right. You know what I mean? And so yeah. like it don't even really matter if it's like a million people watch or a thousand people because this is gonna last forever. Uh, right. These conversations that we have and those tapes you made. They you know still, I mean? yeah. You, they, right. they, they, you, you and like we're watching right here, like and this stand, is 10, 15 years ago. Too. And staying relevant is that too. Cody you know? Beastly. Yes, Cody Beastly. <laughs> uh-huh, <laughs> that see? fucking Rome, you know? Yeah. Damn. But even new shit, you know, staying with, with what's moving and mm-hmm. what's trending and what's popping in Denver. Because soon that'll be the next, you know, this yeah, world was popping at that it. time. Yeah, yeah you're still so doing it. it. It's, it's, you know, it's we really take breaks dope. every once in a while, but we come back if we're, if, if, you I, know. I it's, feel like hip hop's my life, bro. Yeah, you fucking, yeah. Ever I'm a little shorty, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. Like you, did, you were doing it too before there was all this, like, access yeah. to podcasts and all this kind if, of if shit. If you look yeah. at the DVDs when we're doing interviews, I do an interview with you. Yeah, you was on that smack shit. You was like, you was smack. You was on that shit. You a podcast. You was making mic stage. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I mean. In our city. You that guy. Right. You know what I mean? And I feel like that particular thing you talking about, about bridging hip hop or like the, the shit that was like whatever, backpacker shit and street shit. Right. That's really you. Like, I remember you introduced Foe to Decca. Right. And Leslie, that's how I met Foe. And that's how right. I, so, you know what that's I mean? Because, wild. and I remember he was so supportive. That's crazy. Like, I remember that song, Ba Ba. By about second time around, that that could join. About, yep. He was on the video. You know what I mean? He was hyped, and I was shocked. Cause I was like, oh, I, I thought for sure niggas from across town would not fuck with the vibe. Right. You know what I mean? But everybody loved Decca. Everybody was like, yo. Now, Decca, yeah, dude, is the first nice. time I met Decca, oh, yeah, bro, bro, it was like. I met him after a party at the Snake Pit, someone's crib, and they were just freestyle. I remember there were some little hot Bettys there, the Francois sisters, shout out, you know, Dana and Christina, you know what I mean? I know they still looking good as fuck. <laughs> Shit, shout out. Yeah, but anyway, I remember that, yeah. He was up there freestyling. He's killing it, bro. And it's funny, because, like, he had left, and I approached Inkline, and fucking, I was like, hey, who's that? You know, and he told me, oh, it's this full dick. I was like, damn, that fool's tight. And I told, kind of gave my little spiel. I got this mixtape shit I'm trying to do. And I was like, you know, tell him to hit me up. Here's my number. And like, I ended up meeting and running the deck probably like three months later. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And we ended up connecting. But yeah, man, right off the bat, like, I noticed him and I was like, damn, that fool's killing it. And he's yeah. just fucking around. Yeah. You know what I mean? I would say, in my opinion, as far as pure rappers that I know, and I grown up with, like, I gotta give it up. I think he's the best. You know what I mean? Like, in terms of like that natural gift and ability to just rap. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, obviously he's dope at everything, but what I'm saying is like, some people are just blessed. You know what I mean? And he's like one of them type rappers. He has it. Like, yeah, that's why he and go once to New you York. Start, once yeah. you start polishing it up. Yeah, you know what and, I mean? And that's the thing Bro, about he's, he's. I mean, I've said it since the beginning. So you can go check the first podcast we did. I think I said it. He's he's my favorite MC. I think from Denver. You know, he's, that's. I mean, bro. Let me tell you something. I'm online. I'm in a group that's it's called Decalog. They're like, it's a Deca fan club. Basically. Right. And the thing that <laughs> yeah, strikes me, got some crazy yeah, numbers. Yeah, yeah. It's a fan club. It's, uh, and yeah. the thing that strikes me is everybody in there's like, this nigga saved my life. Like, they don't say that word. Yeah. But they be like, but that they could be. save my life. Nah, yeah, that could yeah. save my life. Like, his music saved my life. That's the recurring uh, thing. And that, that shit is so powerful to me because that's the type of shit right. I want to do. And he's already, right. he's already, he's just a dope MC. But, like, if you resonate with what he says, you're definitely feeling it's that shit. It's healing like he, music. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? It's healing yeah. music. Like, he talks, he don't talk about just the degradation. He talks about the reconstruction. He All talks right. about how you get through. He talks about, mm-hmm. and, and he sound better for it. Like a lot of people talk about the good old days of their their uh, you know wild days, their fucking hedonist days. Like that was the best shit. But mm-hmm. he talks about it like I made it through, and he sounds better now. You hear right, him napping, right, and it's right. like 
I want to be like him. I don't want to be like these motherfuckers who's talking like, I'm high, I'm high. He's like, I used to be high. I mean, I'm straight now. You know what I mean? And right. it just sounds so and Even good. the way he said it when he was high. Like, the way he yeah. talked oh, yeah. about being high. Yeah. You know, oh, don't get me wrong. Many motherfuckers yeah. want to be high. <laughs> no, he was so good. Well, he's so good. The man, yeah. was, he, like, all his shit was just so proper. You know what I mean? All the way to, to now and the shit he's doing now is he's, he's stayed dope. And, but he's changed, and it's yeah. all changed. Well, I think that's the thing that happened with the hedonist is, like, I remember his first album was called Top of the Line, Bottom Feeder. And that was, we were all living at this house, and I had the MPC, and I was making beats, and he was, like, interested. And he was like, well, I want to I wanna make beats. Teach me how to make beats or whatever. So I showed him how to use the shit. Right. But then he, he has this incredible ear. Like, one of the things about making beats from samples is you find disparate samples and match the pitches. You can hear all these go together. These notes, these math. I was never really good at that. I had a good for sonic qualities. Like, this is a rough sound, a drum kit. Sound right. good. But he had the notes. So he was a person to be like, this goes with that. And I'd be like, Whew. Mm. You know what I mean? So even when I was teaching him, he was teaching me. Teaching so then when you. we went to the hedonist, I remember after Top of Line Bottom Feeder, he was like, man, I'm kind of like drifting. I don't know what I want. I was like, let's make another album for you. Let's start making. So that was when I made that beat for second time around or whatever. Da da. Right. Da-da. And that was the start of the album. But basically, he would come over to my crib every day. We'd make beats and we'd have the turntable and shit. And we would just, me and him, make the beats for this album together. And in that process, he was really learning how to use NBC. And I was really learning his musicality. He was teaching me how to put samples together, the pitches, the notes, and all that other shit. To, to the point where, like, in the middle of his album, I got so excited, I started another one. I was like, ah. Oh. Yeah. All right. <laughs> my, really my, my, my. With it. <laughs> you know, but. <laughs> Then after that, he got his own MPC. And Started that's, making beats. And that's the veil, everything oh, you have yeah, after that. His that self-produced, shit. too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know self-produced I mean? shit. Yeah. Forest of Gates, all because that shit was... Something about the nature of that making beats like that with the vinyl and, and the MPC, he's, that's his shit. He still right. do it like that. Yeah. Like yeah. It's 20 fucking 2001 or whatever. You know what I mean? But I've since moved on to different type of production techniques. But like, I feel like in that process of him making the hedonist, he really crystallized his stuff. Right. You know what I mean? To where like he was off the races. Right. So I think part of it is like one of the things I most admire about him is his sense of self. Like there for me, there'll be a lot of stuff going on culturally. I'd be inspired. I wanna do some of this. I wanna do some of that. I wanna throw in these trap beats. I wanna do this. I wanna do that. And he was always like, nah, this is what I do. This is what I like. And, and, you know, as time changed, it was harder to pinpoint what is, like, that true school shit that's fly. You know what I mean? Right. You get into exile, blue. Generationally, it shifts, it shifts. He always had the needle nose to be like, oh, this is that new fly shit mm-hmm. of this strain of rap. Of this, right. You know right, I mean? right. Of that, of the evolution of where, right. of where, where he was shit, on. Shit. So we're now, we on... Malcomy together. Both of us love Malcomy. You know who that is, mm-hmm. the rapper? I yep. don't. I don't. Yep. Yep. Yeah, Malcolm, that's yep. both our Hell favorite yeah. rappers dope, in dope, the world. Dope. But, like, it's just cool because it's, like, 20 years later, here we are. We see eye to eye. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? There's finally a rapper because I think for so long, it'd be like I was more like a Wu-Tang guy. He's more like a Tribe guy. Not yeah. that he didn't love Wu-Tang and not that I didn't love Tribe. But you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, right. Like, in There's terms of different ethos. Yeah. Absolutely. And, there, and I feel like as time got more and more unkind to this strain of hip hop that we grew up with and became much more factual with other stuff. It's it's they ended up being artists like Mankami or whatever who just because they carried the spirit, they still got the spirit, but they pushing it a little bit forward, then now we're both like, oh, this is our favorite dude. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because it's not like mm-hmm. a bunch of choices. Now, that, now there's not like nah, a Wu Tang and a Tribe. Right. There's, it's not like Zelda, that. and yeah. that's it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, there's like fucking Dump God. You know what I mean? A couple Real like shit. that strain of shit. But like, and then there's probably some really dope shit that you don't find because there's so much bullshit to filter through. Yeah, yeah, right. for sure, for sure. But there I feel is like some dope little yeah, you know underground do- cast that oh, are no, fucking for sure, murder. For sure. But yeah, you're right though on on a, on a scale on that scale. But also think about like that indie rap shit that like was popping at the time, like Aesop Rock, yeah, yeah, all that yeah. shit. Like, to me, he kind of the last one left, sort of. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. like he was influenced by that, but like his style has stood that test of time to where it's like those same kids who loved Aesop Rock, who loved now they love Decca, right? Yeah, you know yeah. What I mean? And yeah. like, 
it's uncanny to me because. It's not by design. It's not like he's like, I'm going to capture those fans. He just does it, bro. He just does it. You know what I mean? And that's all it. different like eras. Like, I remember like this was a while ago. It was like some 420 show mm-hmm. with him in Fast Forward. And like, there are these fools, like at least 20 fools that knew every word of every song he sung. And I'm just like, uh, Bro, I went to like, a show the other day. And I mean, like I said, I mean, they were rapping along to everything. And I think that's what I'm saying is it's like that process of self-discovery. I feel like he did it right. 20 years ago. You know what I mean, like mm. the process of discovery I've recently completed to where I made this record I just finished to where it's like, this is what I'm going to stand on. Because I feel like there's a lot of like the difference, say, between somebody like him and somebody like me is that like that strong sense of self that he had. He it, like to me, I feel like so much stuff would occur that would excite me. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to interpolate this in my work. I want to interpolate this in my work. And not necessarily having that wherewithal to be like, this ain't it. You know, I love it, but I don't do it. Right. You know what I mean? If I loved it, I was going to try it. You know, and I feel like he was somebody who could, be, who could love something, who could be like, you know, we was all on screw. We was all on all type of shit, but he was never trying to make screw music. Right. You know what I mean, he was never screwing his shit. You know what I mean? I was screwing all type of shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, you see yeah, what I'm yeah, saying yeah. here? But I'm not saying I'm wrong or he's wrong. Mm-hmm. But what I'm saying is now I feel like the difference is, I'm a lot more of like a, nah, I don't do that. Like to where it's before, it's like, yeah, I could do that. I could do anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? He was more on like on, on the path and keeping it, like keeping it on mm-hmm. the path. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Where you're more I was branch doing, out, yeah. share this and that yeah. and fucking, you know yeah. what I mean? And I feel like that's what I'm saying is like, my like for me, like when we get into my new record or whatever, it's like my relationship with music, I feel like, through hip hop is how I crystallized the way I make music. The way, but I was always deeply infatuated with other genres of music. Right. You know what I mean, like yeah, good music is good music. Man. You know what I mean, but like I feel like particularly like say when I was like in seventh grade, sixth grade, I wanted to an alternative rock band. You know what I mean, and then eventually, you know, I remember oh, freshman yeah. year. Who were you listening to, bro? Oh, six, seven. I mean, you know, I think at this point it was KS one of uh what's that? K D P I. Uh-huh. So it was Radio Rock. So like anything like that was yeah, all, all the Radio shit, Rock. Man. I was loving it. Metallica, you know, Tool, all that stuff. I was like, oh the Deftones. I was gonna say some, say some Green Day. Mm, not, shit was so <laughs> not me. Not I'm not hey, mad at you, but not me. That's not me. My shit was a little darker. I was say their first one. I don't remember the one with all the explosions. That's shit, bro. That's college. Shit. Yeah. That's what the girls like. You know what I mean? So you roll with the girl. Yeah, I didn't like the type of rock the girls. That shit was. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but you know, so like, yeah, like KBPI. No, I, I, I got you. I got you. I know exactly what you're talking about. I was listening to Iron Maiden and ACDC. Yeah. I like you know Black Sabbath. Yeah, that shit's but Black Sabbath. About, yeah. Judas Priest type mm-hmm. shit. Um, yeah. I like some Motley Crue. Fuck yeah. But I feel like, I mean. So when we got into hip hop and shit like that, it was like I was always trying to put those influences in it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like even that first part of the right, album was right, like right. I was listening to Tool. A bunch. Well, there so was, was people, like, and there was other people trying to do that too, even kind of on a on a on a bigger scale. Like who did something with Metallica or Corn? Did something with somebody Snoop, rapping? I remember, I remember Metallica, and Ja Rule did a yeah. song together. Yeah, bro. So Low like, times. So like, Low there times. was already kind of that little yeah. vibe going at yeah. that time. I don't know if it was the same. I think for me, particularly, it was Tool. I was obsessed with Tool yeah, around that bro. time, and I was trying to like weird time signatures, excessive drumming. That yeah, was no right. better drumming. Trying that. to fit it in rap like a fucking weirdo, and it was cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think it came <laughs> together. To circle yeah. in the square. <laughs> I'm trying to put the circle in the square. I'm going to yeah. make it work. Make that, shit, make it work. <laughs> make that shit And that's what I think that's the thing is like, you know, I was always like, in the crew, I was always the nigga like, listening to all this weird shit, putting yeah. weird shit. Outside the box. And I feel like in Denver that helped because this is a rock town. Yeah. You know I mean, that's why I was able to get a lot of light or whatever. But I feel like the difference now is I would just make that music. I wouldn't feel like I got to fit that in rap, not goth rap. Right. Shoot it, rap, right. blah, 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 rap. Right. Just, just make that that's shit, maybe, and, then yeah. make, and then make rap. You know what I mean? Like, so that's the only difference I think for me is it's like that bravery to just be like, I'm full scale making this complete other kind of music. And that would mm. be Pirate Signal, right? Well, I think the Pirate Signal was me trying to mix it with rap. Okay. You know what I mean? And I feel like now is the first time I'm like with Jonas and this whole album favorite. You know what I mean? This is the first time I'm like, this is not rap. 
Right. This is my version of rock music. You know what I mean? Oh. And when I listened to it, I was definitely like, I was expecting rap. I was mm-hmm. definitely expecting some rap. And I was like, this ain't got no rap in it. Mm-mm. You know what I mean? Mm-mm. Has Mm-mm. has the full album dropped yet? No, it's not gonna come out till November twenty third. Oh, right, shit. yeah, I've seen the November twenty third. Yeah, yeah, I'm just working that single, that macaroni joint, because yeah. I feel like I don't know, man. I, that was a special song for me. You know, that was like a real like, like I said, a crystallizing moment of like, oh, this is what I want to do. You know, but also it was the moment where I, I should kind of shed the notion that I had to fit rap. Right. So to me, it's like, even what that song is about, it's just like, it's it's like a mantra. You look in the mirror and you tell yourself, you're you're not an imposter. You're the truth. You know what I mean? Or like somebody else telling you that. Just like again, because when we talk about healing music, when we talk about stuff that's like good for people, mm-hmm. it's like if you're repeating these lyrics, how are they gonna make you feel? When they gonna, what am I telling you? You're a piece of shit. Am I telling right. you I'm better than you? Am I telling right. you I don't money? Right. Or am I telling you you are special? You matter. You know what I mean? And like at the same time, particularly like the vibe, the whole thing with the label I started, Obliterator, is dream pop for Black people mm-hmm. in terms of rock music for Black people. But also the ethos is like healing music for Black people. I'm not gonna put lyrics in there that's degrading to my people in a sense to where it's like if you repeat these lyrics, they will. They are affirmations. They are positive, and and not in a cheesy way or anything like that. Because I feel like I'm not not. I listen to toxic music. I love toxic music. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? I'm not Every knocking day. toxic music. Nah. I'm just saying I don't want to make it. I want to right. provide the antithesis or the alternative. You know. Yeah. Right. The good shit. I mean, it doesn't have to all be bad. No, it doesn't. Yeah. And that's what I mean. It's like sounds liberating, honestly. And that's the whole vibe. Is black liberation. The whole vibe is like uh, really about because it's a personal thing. Because I feel like the revolution is first personal. Like, you really got right. to feel yourself. You have to you fucking fix feel it. Yeah, yourself. it's all about you. So this, that album is, this album is about me fixing myself before right. we turn the gaze outwards. But I think the reality is, like, there are so many systems of iniquity in the world. You talk about racism, homophobia, all this other But there are systems of inequity within us. Just in ourselves. ourselves. Right. Right. You know what I mean? And, and part of that is those behaviors. Like, why do we harm ourselves with substances? Why do we harm ourselves with food? Why do we harm ourselves in relationships? All these other things right. that, like, even if the world around you were fixed, you would still be at war with yourself. Right. You exactly. I mean? That's your own, said your that. own mind. Right. Yeah. And how could you make a, a better world in, in an image that you can't even create for yourself? You know, it's, it's, it's rough. So that's what I was doing those eight years. You know what I mean? Damn. Like, that's what I was doing those eight well, that's years. That's real work. And that's the thing about it is, like, music means a lot different to me now because I feel like. It's on your what, terms, right? It's on my terms, and that's when I talk about Decca. He was always doing it on his terms. Always on his terms. Yeah, you're right. 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 That's what I'm right. saying. Right. I feel he was blessed always to have a fucking... Doing, always doing it on his terms yeah. to where, like, now I know what my terms are. And, and part of it is, like, I think there's a big delusion, a big capitalist scam with music to where stardom and the notion of stardom putrefies music because people believe that that's the validation. Mm-hmm. Like you could make something amazing and it makes you feel really good and you love it, but unless millions of other people right. love it right. too, it's not good. Right. It's black. It's trash. Nah. You know what I mean, if that's your scale, you're fucked. Right. So I think there's a, a big thing about like just having that relationship with your music and yourself first, and that really being the core of anything you build on. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, like, I feel like for me. I was deluded in a lot of ways because I feel like I initially, when I made music, I didn't have this delusion, I'm gonna be famous, I'm gonna be big. I was 16 years old, I was making beats, you know, street niggas was on, it was street shit, you know what I mean? I'm this weirdo dude, I was like, I'll never be on, but this is what I love, I'm gonna right. do it, I'm gonna do it. And then as we kept doing shit, the pirates, you know, whatever, people in the time were like, y'all are gonna blow up, y'all are gonna blow up, y'all are gonna blow up. And this infected my mind to where it's like, it, it went from being this thing where it's like, I'm doing this because I love it, despite knowing that it's perhaps not commercially viable or whatever to now because other people may have potentially seen some commercial viability in it now it's my concern now I gotta be concerned about making this mm. more commercially mm. now I'm trying to make records that right. for other people for that other I people. don't have no emotional connection to anymore you know what I mean and yeah. it's like I mean and it, that happened simultaneously with the drugs that's mm. happened simultaneously with people giving you substances They're that's what we're just kind of talking about just so you know yeah. what I mean feeding into it feeding like the, into it and so you just I'm helping really, them out right. you lose your connection you're like what am I doing this for you don't even know and that's what I'm saying is it's like 
for me, I didn't really figure that out until I was 38 years old. In terms of like, I don't really feel like somebody could come in now and infect my relationship with music. Right. And maybe it's because I'm recently turned 40, or maybe it's just more because of that process. Because I don't believe it's age. Right. Like I had that process 20 fucking years ago, in my opinion. And, right, but but you like you said though, there's neither of you were wrong in it. You no. gained so much doing yeah. it your your way and being down with so much more and openness, you know. Whereas like yeah, Decca got to hone in on exactly what his his mission and his goal was, but you had a wide array of and that's why yeah. you're not even doing no hip hop now. No regrets. Right. Now you're not even doing hip hop. <laughs> yeah. Now. yeah. All other wild shit. And that's what I'm dope. saying. I just I, cool. if I have any regrets, it's that <laughs> it's that I didn't do this process sooner, that I didn't just say right. fuck everyone. This I'm gonna do me. Niggas right. had to die. My best friend had to die for me to do this. You feel me? Mm -hmm. Like like I had to get isolated because for whatever reason, I did not have this sense of self, sense of strength, internal fortitude, whatever, mm -hmm. to make these decisions in the presence of these other people. Now, one of the things I say is different, say, between me and Deca is like, and this is where you get into the complicated nature of race and, and music and stuff, but I feel like it's a lot less weird for a white person to make rap music than it is for a black person to make rock music. <laughs> it is way more of a juxtaposition. So my inclination to make rap or to fit this that. stuff in the rap, seriously, <laughs> I didn't seriously. even think about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah my inclination to fit even... this stuff in the rap is because the world is telling me, bro, you package it like rock, it's not going to go. Right. It's definitely right. not going to go. You definitely got to somehow make this weird tool-based shit you obsess with into rap music as a black man in America. Or it's not going to go. And I heard that loud and clear. I heard that message. And, and, and something we got to be really clear with is when the code word for, for the hard R in modern society is rapper. So if somebody's like, yo, I make blankety blank rap, that the code word for black. Even if you're white people, that's the code word for black. So where it's like, mm -hmm. as a black person, you like, if I don't include that element, Mm -hmm. I'm really I'm screwed you know what I'm saying so like you you have this thought in your brain of like all right concession compromise okay boom I'm already in the hole I'm already down because I'm already yeah you're already in misalignment right. with what I wanted to do to where it's like I see it in the world now I see like Willow Smith I, I mean obviously there was so much that occurred in that time like because when I did Black Hearts and all this other stuff talk about goth rap and stuff Lil P, you know, Lil Uzi Vert, yeah. some of stuff, right. Wayne, you know what I mean? Right. That started to occur. But, like, as far as actually seeing black people making rock music in 2022, I can think of a bunch of people who are doing it. I can think of Willow Smith, who's, like, commercially successful, maybe. Mm -hmm. And that's Will Smith's fucking daughter. Right. You know what I mean? Right. If you got to be Will Smith's daughter to yeah. make rock music and be black and successful. That's what I was talking about Steve Lacey. Is Steve Lacey somebody else who's like, he's playing, because like even the context of watching a black man step on stage and play his guitar to a roving crowd of teenagers <laughs> is idiosyncratic. You would never seen that in your life. That right. blew me away watching that because it's not, it's not a nigga singing. It's not a nigga rapping. It's a nigga playing his guitar. What is this, 67? You know what I mean? Like, is this Jimi Hendrix? Is this, is this, because that, but that's, that's, that's the, that's like a little bit of what we talk about when I talk about black liberation. This is like, as a black person, you always have to factor in your blackness into everything. You go to the grocery store. You go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So, you want to make music. You have to factor in your blackness. Who, how they going to Especially if you're making rock music. Especially if you're making rock, I mean, yeah, exactly. You gotta be like how like I'm gonna stratify country it. music type. Yeah, it's like if I'm making country music, right. maybe, yeah. But right. if you're a white person, you can do anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? no, you're absolutely right. So and, and actually, get get more recognition for it. Like, there's cats that are burning all these little white rappers out here, and they're just not getting no recognition because I mean, they're not white rappers. And, when we and talk I, about that, I, I don't dislike white rappers. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm, I I don't have like I said, Decca's one of my favorites from no. Denver. But, bro. It's a whole different fucking life. It's, it's a different a game. thing. I it's think a, here's the reality oh, situation game. is that white people in America and white people in the world can enjoy a song from a black artist, can enjoy music, but they need a white artist to identify with. Right. 
They need an Eminem. Right. They can enjoy 50 Cent. They can enjoy Snoop Dogg. They can enjoy Dr. Dre, but they need an Eminem. <coughs> right. They need a Jack Harlow. Yep. And that's that's the deep integration of white supremacy. It validates the culture of, for them. It validates it because it, it's not even otherwise there. It's, it was uh, yes. <laughs> but I feel like, think about this on the flip side, as, as say a black person. If you love rock music, mm -hmm. you're not going to wait until there's a black rock star to like rock music. You never, you never like rock. You, you just, like you just got to learn to love well, white artists. He also made that shit up too. So yeah, I mean, let's not begin let's the not colonized, even get yeah, all that the shit, colonized but, nature but it's of been, rock. No, music. but it's the same fucking thing. And that was the fear with rap too. With it's Eminem, the same that was thing. the thing. Was like, oh, are they about to do this again? About to do this shit again? They're about to do this shit again? But I think the difference is like the sauce comes from. You can't the, get yeah. The sauce you can't get it. Yeah. Eminem don't make the sauce. And you see where it comes from. Yeah. You see where the sauce comes from. Now we're way more held, way more accountable. We got social media. We got all the shit that shows like ah so and so was doing that first. You can't just be taking that shit, mm -hmm. Elvis. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm just playing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, <laughs> no, for real, that's some real shit. Yeah, bro. you can't have an Elvis moment in 2022 right. though. You can't do that anymore. You can't do that. But anymore. I think that that's. That's what I'm saying. Is like the social elements sort of backing me up to where it's like, when I say when I talk about <laughs> the regerts or whatever, right. it's like, even though. It's still a little bit like going against the grain right now. I do have some wind in my sails with no. society at large. Like I see, I see a social ship. I see a Steve Lacey. I see, see Willow Smith. I see a cultural movement that's. She's something happening. I see so, and that gives me a little bit more bravery, to where it's like. Because if you really are operating in a vacuum, you kind of have to. Say to yourself, this could never happen, and I could live in obscurity. And you got to be okay with that. And I don't necessarily know that that's something I'm, you know what I mean? That I'm totally okay with. Like, mm -hmm. I'm just going to toil in obscurity forever. No one's ever going to get it. No, that's not what I nah, want. Nah, you know nah. what I mean? I want the people to fill it or whatever. So I think that there's a, a nature like, is there a social, I guess the best way to put it is, is there a cultural movement aligning with my own views and values? Right. You know what I'm saying? Because if that's occurring, then we got a movement. Then, then I'm not alone. Well, I, th I think, I think really, uh, this is just my opinion. I don't, I think it don't, don't matter really, because you're there's so few people actually doing it that have a platform that you already that that like you have already. Mm -hmm. They don't, not as many people starting off doing what you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. They don't have that same back. You have a background already that you you did this other thing. Yeah, a did whole different hard. identity. And, like, and you know so now re almost like rebrand. But in the lines, but it's almost rebranding. You gotta rebrand that shit. Yeah, like we but talked the about same earlier. You, it's the still same me. you, it's still me. but rebranding of it. I mean, I think that that sets it aside. Even like uh, it puts it up on a whole nother. Like yo. You're starting with an already dope artist. You're not starting with like awesome kid that came out of art school and fucking knows how to yeah, play a guitar no, I feel, I, and, I, and whatever, you know? I mean, I think one of the things too that's different about what I'm doing is like, I'm very clearly saying, when I say dream pop for black people, dream pop is a genre of rock. It's a subgenre of rock that's kind right. of made famous by this band. There are a couple bands that are kind of obscure. One is called Cock Two Twins. They're kind of, were, they were really, Prince loved them. Um, the Cure loved them. They were, they were big in the '80s, but okay. kind of. Big. But the term "dream pop" was coined by this black band called A.R. Kane, who, again, obscurity. Right. You never heard of them. Right. So to me, it was like the kind of music it is, which is this is really soft, beautiful stuff. The vibes you hear <laughs> my shit, but I was like, I'm not making. One of the things that you get taught as a black artist is, if you're not making black music, in the veins that black people know it is, you will be doomed to be only liked by weird white people. If right. you're an obscure black artist, your audience will right. be Weird. white people. Okay. But that's a scam. <laughs> your audience is other black people. You're just deluded into thinking that. So what I'm saying is I'm making this music for other black people like me. I'm not like, hopefully hipsters like it. Hopefully pitch for it. Fuck right. them. Fuck the white gays. This is for other black people like me mm -hmm. who need a wider lane. And it's like the notion of making music for only black people is like, what? That's you're gonna be underground forever. Okay then, then I don't give then a that's fuck. That's what it is. Right. You know what I mean? Right. But if a movement happens to align with those same values and what you're and doing, I believe it will. Then that's then then that's a super dope bonus. But that's it's so much. It means so much more that that's not the drive behind it. And that's it. what we talk about with that. People like, make their music up. with that drive. Yes. You know, I stand on my shit, yeah, and that's yeah. what I'm saying. That's what we talk about with like like Decca and all them. It's like this is a decision. I feel like. An artist like him made 20 years ago mm -hmm. right. that I'm making now. Right. And the stakes are different. I'm not saying it's the same. 
I'm just saying that notion of like, okay, come hell or high water, I'm doing this. You know what I mean? That's how I'm going to move. And and I think that was uh, scary for me because it's like the people I do know, the, the I don't know how they're going to react. You know what I mean? I didn't know how you was going to feel about the music. I didn't know. I, yeah. And it's just like, everybody might hate it. Am I going to be at peace with myself and at war with the world? <laughs> you know what I mean? Or vice versa. Right. And I, I'd much rather choose the former. Right. For sure. For sure. And I wanted to ask you earlier, because um, mm-hmm. we were talking about like being in Denver and people catering and all that shit, what comes along with all that shit. You had to be a fucking rock star when you're in L.A., because you're talented and you know what I mean and you're fucking making moves what was that shit like was it was it a whole different monster like or was it just super amped up uh, ha, ha, ha. you know in LA it was my pronounced active addiction when I was the most but in a lot of ways LA is Disneyland for drug addicts it's very normalized right, right, you know what right. I mean like my the guy who leased me my apartment was my drug dealer Okay. You see what I'm saying? Mm. Like, that's how mm. integrated it is to where it's like. There's a really dope scene behind <laughs> <laughs> drug use. Well, I just think part of it was like, so I kind of was bankrolled. And I I was like, I'm just going to wild out. You know what I mean? I got, mm. So, like, I was out in the scene. I was making friends. I was doing a lot of shit. But I was also getting higher and higher and higher and getting introduced to scarier and scarier drugs and normalizing them at the same time right to where that's what really dissipated was like i'm not gonna bankroll this no more you're like you you wilding out doing hella drugs you done, you done made 800 beats and no songs right. you know what i mean like what's popping bro i'm not bankrolling this <laughs> shit no more <laughs> no nah bro i'm gonna tell you this album i said it took me eight years i have literally made thousands thousands of pieces of music Right. To get these eight songs, and the part of it was just like you be spinning your wheels, you be on high on this, high on that. You think you making some banging shit? Mm-hmm. You spinning your fucking wheels. You know what I mean? It's and not. It's not. It's not. None of it. None of it is usable. I got. I got it all. Shit. It's right. all bad. <laughs> so I remember oh, flying through the crib there in downtown LA, and you're making beats. You, you were there. See, yeah. I don't even remember oh, how shit. high I was. <laughs> no. Yeah. The nigga came out. Nah, you know what though? So yeah, so I was basically be in the house all day making beats, getting high as fuck, and then we go out at night and I go make friends and shit like that. But I feel like at first when I first got there I was networking, glad handed and we was you know what I mean? And then, then it kinda just turned into like, too much. Yeah. Eventually I'm just nerding out and then like we'd go to like very lame back alley strip clubs. It was not networked. Back alley strip clubs. Bro. Huh? <laughs> you remember Concept? You remember Concept? Concept is a, he's a, he's a strip monger. Right he's yeah. a stripper yeah. monger. Actually, he's on the, yeah. oh, wait, where's he at? Him and, him and Lorenzo. That nigga would go to strip clubs for the food, bro. You know what I mean? Like, it's, he just chill. It's funny, dog, because he did take us he to a strip club. Yes. He, yeah. he took us to a strip club in East Los Angeles, fool. And there were like low riders in the parking lot. And they're badass bitches, and you could tell they're baller fools. Like they're yeah. just nah, nah. That's that's what I would do. Cause like, I mean, shout out to him, bro. Like, unfortunately, you know, drugs broke us up or whatever. Me and old dude. But like, when I got to LA, he was already there. That was right. the first dude I called, and he was she pulled up on me, blah blah blah. You know what I mean? But at the same time, he was deeply entrenched in the negativity and darkness as well. So it was, right. it was a marriage of negativity you know what I mean and mm-hmm. then we lived together but it was just sick like I didn't even get out of toxicity until I completely stopped kicking it with all those people you know what I mean and got away and then I was like I gotta go to Rio right. <laughs> you know what I mean like yeah. but if I'd have been kicking it who knows bro hey can yeah. you talk about what we talked about earlier the show that you guys got booked for that was in a hood that you didn't know that you thought oh. was some other place and didn't concept actually kind of come yes that was Can a wild time that? okay so this is the pirate signal and we were on a tour and that was i remember fo was was like doing uh vocals with me there was this dj named dj soup and there was shay and so and and sh- and shay was like the guitarist she's this young chick and right, soup, i remember them niggas are soft, bro. Them <laughs> niggas, they wanted no parts. So I bet. we thought the show was in Huntington Beach. Right. But the show was in Huntington, Huntington Park. Park. And Huntington Park is not is Huntington the Beach. Jetto. It is the Jetto. <laughs> okay, so the thing was, 
we went to this joint, oh, right? Fuck. And for some reason, I guess concept, as you can see, I mean, he called by Mikey now, but he's covered in these tattoos. Apparently, they were the wrong tattoos for the neighborhood we were in. Oh, so, shit. So he was like, yo, they tell me we got problems. And I'm like, bro, we playing this show. You need to batch this shit up. Right. Somehow, there was some sort of gang truce initiated just so he could chill and we could play this show to five people. But I'll never forget this shit, right? The niggas so soup had this shit. Yeah, five hood ass niggas, too. Oh, and the DJ, set up, <laughs> the DJ set up with soup. And so they was like, soup got to play music all day. This nigga, all he had was Macklemore beats no. I shit you not because a week earlier he had the DJ for Macklemore no. we opened up for Macklemore Macklemore didn't have a DJ he was like will you play my shit for me so the only music this oh, nigga had was Macklemore instrumentals I'm talking about red hot chili pepper samples right like this nigga dropping beats with red hot chili pepper samples and no bass in the hood I was like oh, we gonna die y'all <laughs> and then the Pyre Signal music you know, it go hard, but it's definitely not for street niggas from Huntington Park or whatever. But I remember, <laughs> probably not, probably not. I remember there was a song where one of them was like, "East Side, throw your hands up, whatever." That was the lyrics, and that <laughs> one was like, "Don't say that part." <laughs> Cut that shit. Like, Don't fucking and say that And I did it. Part. I did it anyway. And then I'm just like, "Bro, I can't believe you said that East Side shit." And I was like, "But." It was cool. I mean, I think that was a community event, you know. Yeah. So East like, East Denver and fucking Huntington yeah, Park. Yeah, I know. I, that could have. He didn't know, cause you know, I feel like Foe having been with the shits was acutely aware of the danger. Right. He Me not being right with away. the shits was not acutely aware, of living in obliviousness. But I also feel like, for instance, a nigga like Concept or a nigga like Foe, they know they're being sized up. They know they're being. They know. Them niggas look at them like, oh, you could be with the shit. Right. They're not looking at me like I'm with the shit. I'm a nah. non I'm a non factor. You know? <laughs> so like we just got different concerns. But that was definitely one of those situations where it was like, I can't believe I led them into that. But they held me down, they had my back and shit like that. Like that nigga Marcos could have just bailed. Right. <laughs> it was like, yo, they told me I got the wrong gang tattoos. I can't take this off. Right. Yeah, but he was like, nah. They patched it up. So he could stay and watch the show. That's hilarious. Yeah, it was cool though. It was cool. I don't. I don't regret. Damn. No regrets. No regrets. Nah. <laughs> that was a good time That's too. That's wild. Any other kind of crazy stuff in Cali? Um. Well, you know that loft that you came to. Right. That was. Wasn't like half burnt down or some shit. Yo, it and was. And they filmed shit there. At the top? When we moved in there, it was in renovation. So, like, I needed a place we could be loud. Right. I went to exactly. L.A. to make music. So, I was like, we was going to these apartments. You know what I mean? I'm like, this ain't going to work. And so, finally, we I'm like an artist loft. And we find an artist loft downtown. This shit is unfinished. Like, the ground is cement with, with screws sticking out the bottom. You know what I mean? Oh, like, shit. no kitchen. There's no fridge. Oh, shit. There's just a bathroom and a giant concrete box. I was like, oh, it's perfect. Right. And this yeah. nigga Fo, he was like, I, I was, I was getting a place. You know, you gonna move out there after I get the place. So he didn't know what place I got. Oh, I shit. got the place. That's right downtown too. Yeah. He pulled up. He was like, what you mean? I ain't got a kitchen. <laughs> I was like, ah, we, we can make beats. Yeah. And the nigga, was, so we had to go to bed, bed, bed whatever, and buy a kitchen and build a kitchen. Oh <laughs> In this shit. Motherfucker. Oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> now, cause he was like, I'm fat. I gotta eat. So uh, <laughs> that's what that nigga said. He would cook though, to his credit. But oh, he's bomb ass cook. We had to buy a fridge. Mm -hmm. He had to buy this. But so basically, it was this giant, just like a storage unit. Box. It looked yeah. like a, just well, a, a one, big like storage said, unit, box. with a garage door. I got my beat set up. We got beds that are like basically, you know, the joints you buy from Home Depot, whatever you build. But we had to build partition walls. Like our beds are right next to each other. Like, yeah, you know yeah shit. Mean? Partitions and right. shit. But yeah, that place turned into the trap. Like I used to have. At one point, I was living with two ex porn stars. After Fo left, two ex porn stars, both like strung out as fuck, and Marcos. So I was with the dealer, two other junkies who were also sex workers, and me. And I'm just making beats, and they're just like, trigger trapping. Yeah. yeah. Every 
everybody trapping. This nigga Marco's trapping. These hoes trapping, bro. I'm just making beats. The trap going on. Yeah, so it was an extended wild story for about two years. You know what I mean? My oh, landlord slash dope dealer crossed the hall. It's a wild time, bro. Selling drugs and pussy. I'll <laughs> drugs and pussy. I'm making beats. That's I'm soundtracking the trap, bro. It was a long time. Beats. Yeah, I'm selling beats. I'm trapping beats. You know what I mean? Oh I'm keeping it legit. God. Nah, it was wild though, just because like I remember, I Michaela moved to LA at that point too. My girl, mm-hmm. she, so she had a place in Pasadena. So I would leave and go up there. And the rest of these fucking lunatics and junkies would just be in just that wild the fuck out. And then they'd be banging and fighting to get at it and calling me, oh my God, oh my God. And I'm like, nigga, I'm in Pasadena. I don't got a car. Figure it out. That's but just far, I'm too. I'm just high making beats in Pasadena. You know what I mean? Right. But like, it was just definitely <laughs> like, when I look back at it now, I'm like, that was insane. It was so normal. You know what I mean? And I think I liked having all these people around because they were more people giving me drugs. But right. I mean, like, Particularly like the porn stars, like they have, they were well past their days of grace. You know what I mean? <laughs> they were shot the fuck they were out, well and they were beyond. zombies, and they were just walking around, and it was just normal to have these fucking, you know what I mean? Knox, bro, straight knocks, like heads. Now it's crazy because when I went to your crib over there, bro, like I swear, Elvis, I seen like the most graffiti in like probably like a three, four block radius that I had ever kind of really seen because they were like, even across the street and shit, I was like, God damn it. It was wild, It was grimy where we lived. It was like a few blocks past Skid Row, but there was this, there's these train tracks right behind our house. Right. And these train tracks, like, now if you go by that area, that's just, like, what they say now is that a lot of hijackers are getting those trains. Like, Mm -hmm. like, like, Oh, that's where the trains are getting jacked or jumped They got drones, yeah. Right oh, there. Shit. So it'd be like, if you go there now, you just see tons of like Nike boxes and shit. You know what I mean? Oh, damn. Yeah. They, like, they got all that shit. But back then, it would just be trash. But it, you could just walk along this train track and you see hella graffiti. Yep. So it was like, not qu- it was like skittier, bro. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? More skitty. Skittier. Skittier, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Skid row It was even worse. It was, it was worse. And I think that was the thing, too, about it. was so like the nunchuck arm guys at. You know, it's like the homelessness <laughs> crisis <laughs> Shoot, in L.A. Crazy. is exploding. But that was right before that. You know what I mean? But, like, I don't know. You know what ended up happening is um, a homegirl of foes ended up renting a spot there and had a studio. Mm-hmm. And it was called, like, Studio 2190. That same loft space after we... Is that where they used to throw the parties? Uh, yeah, I think Just so. kind of roll Adrian up. Adrian Swish or whatever. Uh, I don't know what happened. I think the pandemic shut that down. But it was a cool spot. Had I had my shit together. Right. You know what I mean? That would have been lit. But instead, of, I made it seedier somehow. Mm. I made Skid Row even. Sick. Sicker, yeah. That's dope. Mm-hmm. That's actually a cool. It's got a little flex. It's yeah, got a little it flex, flex, though. Yeah, yeah. I brought. I made. How many I'm, people can say that? Shit? How many? How many people can make say they made Skid Row even the scummier? Scummier. Hell yeah. I'm an accomplished. Nah, I see you. I actually <laughs> respect, I respect yeah, that. Yeah, nah. I mean, I think part of the thing about it was like, like for instance, with with Marcos and like that whole situation is like, some niggas operate well in filth, right? Right. And some niggas get into the slot for the first time and they're having a great time, but they're not conducting themselves well. You know right. what I mean? Like some niggas can live in the slot. Yeah, trough, you know, so. you get out the get out the trough. I was right. I was playing in the slot, but I had no business there. You know what I mean? A nigga like Marcos, he lived there. You know what I mean? <laughs> Grew up there. I mean, I, I liken it to this. LA is like a city of dreamers, right? Right. And so you have this pipe dream, right? And most dreamers don't achieve their dreams. They get ensnared somewhere along that pipe. Right, and tangled in the web. And become the pipe scum that ensnares other dreamers. Mm. And that mm. becomes its own ecosystem of ensnaring other young, dumb dreamers because you yourself were a young, dumb dreamer who was also ensnared. It's like a fucking Ponzi scheme of scumbags. Right. So some niggas thrive in that where it's like, oh, yeah, I'm good. It's like a fucking multi-level marketing scheme for for young dumb, scheme. yeah, like like yeah. so somebody wooed you, all you can do is turn around and woo the next man. You know what I mean? And I feel like 
if I'd have stuck around, that's what I would have had to do. Mm. I'd have had to be like being opportunistic with young 21 year old dreamers. Right. Yeah, motherfuckers just want to stay in LA. Though. A lot of people could just leave and not not be a part of that no more. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, but a lot of people love that they're stuck on that. LA, How'd you make LA it out, lifestyle. man? Like I said, bro, I feel like a big part of it was like everything kind of dissipated. Like that loft space, I ended up moving out. And it was just me and Michaela in her spot in Pasadena. I'm fucking withdrawing. I'm getting, you know, and it's like, this ain't it, you know? And so, mm-hmm. like, I remember I read this book. It's called I Forgot to Die by this dude named Khalil something. And it's basically this crazy junkie story. And at the end, he talks about this rehab he went to. Mm-hmm. And I just, on a whim, I was like, fucking, I'm going to call this rehab. And so, basically, I called the rehab. And, and more or less, they Grammy.org, Grammys. Mm-hmm. They will pay for musicians to go to rehab if you can prove your musician's album came out in the past five years or whatever. So, through making that phone call and a wish and a prayer, they're like, "Oh, your musician, blah blah blah." There's this organization applied through this, so then I applied to that, and they got me a bed in a rehab. And damn, yeah, shout out Grammys. Yeah, yeah, for real. Yeah, 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 yeah it's real shit. And so <laughs> that's tough. That was the place I went was this place called Impact which is kind of famous because Robert Downey Jr. went there. Mm-hmm. Um, See where his career yeah, went yeah. after and that. that? Was the, it's like, it's what's it's known as an end of the road type place, like where it's like... Last spot, last, last stop. Yeah, like... Before you're fucking gone. Yeah, right, right. So basically they have this big orange tree in the middle of this place and it used to be you could eat the oranges, but you can't anymore because Robert Downey Jr. would throw them over the thing to his drug dealers. His drug dealers would put heroin in the oranges and throw them back over oh, shit. so now people can't eat the oranges but just shit like that so Sick. like the nigga from red hot chili peppers it was like a kind of famous you know what i mean yeah. and like apparently it used to be like way hardcore like they used to like make you wear these fucking sandwich board signs and be like i'm a dumb junkie and then like clean the floor with toothbrushes and shit like that but that's not what i was there when i was there it was still kind of like militaristic but then niggas would have gave me a toothbrush and said where the sandwich board to scrub the floor i'm like give me some dope get the fuck out of here but um nah it was it was it was a 30 day experience and i remember you know a lot of niggas stay there for a year and a half you know what i mean Because, because they'll help you build your life you'll go you go to this rehab fresh off skid row you know what I mean? And mm. you got a bed and a cot and three meals, and then they'll help you get a job. They'll help you get a place, and then you get your first little crib on the lot, and it's like this little room. You know what I mean? They got to teach you how to be an adult. But I didn't. I wasn't quite there because I feel like a lot of people who go to rehab. They go there because they have to. Right. I went there because I wanted to. So my inclination was not to game the system. Like for instance, it was down the block from my house. At any point, I could have just walked out. You know what I mean? And I remember a lot of people were like, damn, you live down the block? I can't believe you stay in here. And it's like, well, because I want to be here. Right. You know what I mean, I don't, I don't want to do this wanna... shit no more. So I think that because of that nature, like, I was more inclined to believe what was going on, but also I didn't, I didn't feel like I needed to. Like, because, you know, I think they were like AA and all that shit. It's mad culty, bro. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, the main thing they'd be like, you're not special. You're not, you know, like, don't think like your own, we think for you now. Right. Type shit. And it's just like, that's never going to work for me. You you cannot look me in my eye and tell me I'm not special. You crazy, bro. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like, I'm a snowflake. I don't know what the fuck you talking about. So, like, (laughs) out the top, even though they'd always be like, you're not special. But, like, how am I not special? I'm the only nigga here voluntarily. Fuck is you talking about? I'm clearly special. Mm -hmm. But, like, beyond that, you know, they, they really try to take agency from you. Like, you gotta be like, hi, my name is Tom. I'm an addict. They want You've you been clean for 12 here. years. I'm an addict. You're not an addict no more, nigga. At what point? But you, if you're not an addict no more, what you need AA for? Right. You know what I mean? So, like, that's how all rehabs work. They're all 12 step systems. But frankly, the best thing about rehab is it can detox you safely. They will be there with you medically, all this other shit. So if you just need to get to the other, because I think particularly with these heavy ass opiates, yeah. motherfuckers want to quit but can't make it 10 days, 14 days. Was that shit hard as fuck or what? Because I was there, they made it easier. Yeah. But like, if you try to white knuckle that shit, bro, I'll tell you stories about white knuckling that shit will horrify you. Let me just say this. Black stuff comes out of every part of your body. Ah, nigga, I had a diaper on one day. I shit you not. <laughs> because it was just like, I can't control myself. And so, like, you can't cold turkey that shit. It's not healthy. Right. It's not wise. Like, this ain't the basketball diaries. You know what I mean? So, like, you go to a facility. They help you. They walk you through it. You come out the other end. And, yeah, you can join the cult. 
Because they always have this get out the gate by eight in the spoon by noon, which is to say, you know, you'll leave here and go right back to dope. Right. And it's like, you see how scummy that is? Yeah. You see how scummy that is? Yeah. How they're like literally That's like. Fun. They're already saying you just, you can't don't have the control up. to do that. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I shit you not. Like I'm sober a lot just on resentment. <laughs> a lot of, I'm still right. clean a little bit just on like, fuck like, you. Fuck you. Yeah, fuck you. Get out. I'll die that way too. Let me <laughs> suck my dick. Yeah, sober. Last longer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, last longer. Uh, everything I love, bro. So, you know, I think that was part of how I got out was like all the toxic people. Once they were removed, it's like that UB40. I can see clearly now the rain is gone type shit. And again, I'm not of the slop. I'm not of the horse trough. You feel me? So mm-hmm. once I get removed, I'm like, bro, I got I, oh, that's right. I got yeah. clean. Yeah, 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 you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm covered in dirt, right. you know? So I think that's part of the thing with the album, too. Like, with the, this whole thing was like, because when I talk about the opiate crisis that we went through as a generation, indie rap and all this type of shit, it took many forms. It started with Oxycontin. Right. Then Oxycontin got to it. Then there was heroin. Mm-hmm. And now you're looking at fentanyl. You yep. know what I mean? And somebody like me, I feel like I went through all that shit. I, I went through the Oxycontin phase. I went through the heroin phase. I went through the, the fentanyl phase. And I'm a miracle. Because, like, the reality is, most people don't get out any of those phases without maintenance drugs. Most people don't get into, like, you get off those drugs, you're going to be on Suboxone. You're going to be on some, yeah, some right. other fucked up shit. Right. Life. You know what I mean? And, like, for me... So the first time I got off those drugs, I was good. And then I came to Denver and I was good. You know what I mean? And then those those blues, the, the fentanyl pills that we talk about, they came around and shit like that. And it was like, I thought it was something different, you know, kind of reminded me of old school shit. But right away it was like, uh-oh, this is that same shit. You could feel it. Yeah. yeah. So I knew what to do. I was like, let me go get help. And I went and got help. But the main thing was therapy, not maintenance not, 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 it wasn't the substance, not it was you the up. issues, right? Yeah, the, the stuff behind, the stuff behind Why, it, yeah. And I found out the 90% of the reason I was doing drugs was because of that delusion I had about it lubricating the creative process. Right. I wasn't somebody who was using drugs to heal trauma or at some like I wasn't diddled as a kid or some shit, you know. What I mean, great, you, you know, my god, be who you shit. are and be yeah, creative, yeah, yeah, type yeah, yeah. of shit. That was, your... was it, and so like. I kept going back to the well because even after I'd get clean, I'd be like, oh, oh, I'm not making music no more, blah, blah, blah. Maybe it's because I'm not doing it. You know, that would be enough. Right. Right. And then what happened was I realized when this last phase with the with these blues or whatever the fuck was like, I would, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I'd be like, I'm going to do this drug and then go make music. And then wake up with my shit like this on the beat machine. Big fucking beat, like big old button on my forehead. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? I'm not making no music no. on this shit. And so I literally right. knocking you. I literally went to therapy to make the album. I literally got two therapists, and I was like, they were like, "Why are you here?" And I was like, "So I can finish my fucking album." Reality, I was there because I was a fucking drug addict. But that was how I was comfortable saying it. But you know, well, what do you think is stopping you from making an album? <laughs> Drug addiction. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, oh, okay, so we're not here about no fucking album. But I think the bigger picture too is just being self indulgent. Like, I'm the kind of person who's like, if I want it, why I'm gonna, not? yeah, I'm gonna why do not? it. Why right. Not? You got to come up with bigger reasons. And I think the thing for me was like, I really did want to reconnect with my creativity, and I really did realize that like, this is the biggest impediment actually to me being creative. Right. This delusion. Is getting over, yeah, the delusion of needing drugs to be creative. And so with Macaroni, that song particularly was like this dude that I always listened to. His name was Nick Bassett. He was in these bands. One was called Were, and another was called Nothing. And like during this whole period, there were like two bands that were like life changing. Like I listened to them all the time. And I didn't know this one dude was in both bands, right? And eventually I met another friend of his named Sean Durkin who was in this band called Weekend before the weekend like it's like a punk post-punk band and, and like we became friends and I would always talk to him about work I would always talk to him and he was like well you know that boy Nick is producing blah 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 I'll introduce you well it's crazy so he did and I remember I was talking to him and then this Nick he sent me he recorded something on his phone <coughs> and sent it to me and I was like 
That's like the first piece of music somebody had written for me. It wasn't a sample. It wasn't somebody right. spoke. He was like, I wrote this riff for you. And it was just a voice note. That's the sample for Macaroni. I literally took that mm. voice note, made the song. Damn. And then I remember writing that song was literally about, that song is about when I was doing the, the drugs and I was on a phone call with my friend. She, something had happened, like an opportunity presented itself. I was working on this documentary. And she realized that I just had this pronounced imposter syndrome. So she was like, we got to have a meeting. And I was like, okay, well, what do you mean? She's like, FaceTime. And, and there's reading. And there's required reading. <laughs> and it was like, the first line on it was, you are not an imposter. Like, that was literally what, and so like, I wrote about that experience. And it was about, so much about that, but also in this moment realizing, okay, that's the story that made me go, I mean, because I was hot and she saw it in my eyes, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, on the FaceTime call. And it was just like, the shame and embarrassment, that was really the turning point for me where I was like, and it's about that, about like, yo, your relationship with music has nothing to do with these drugs. You know what I mean? It is in you, not on you. And it's not something you can Right, do. right. You know? So like, I feel like... It doesn't come from outside of you. It doesn't come from outside, you know? And that's what that song is about. And that's really, like, macaroni niggas imposters. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because, <laughs> like, that was the thing. It's just like... That's fucking sick. You be thinking you're a Mac. And you know you're a macaroni nigga. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. you are a Mac. You got to decide, you know? And I feel like that was a, a, a distinct process of as through this album, just figuring it out. Like the next song after that was like, it's called Unholy Love. And it's about that little nasty ritual with drugs you alone it's like an unholy love you know mm -hmm. in the room alone with your little drugs or whatever but that was a song that like wasn't like so much music making for me was like here's my idea i'm going to go you know pre-plan this it's like premeditated murder mm -hmm. and that was second degree murder like i just got in the moment made the beat came up with the i didn't write nothing you know what i mean i was just freestyled the whole freestyle thing slow, yeah. and i was like that ain't ever happened you know what I mean? Right, that ain't right. never happened. Why I just let it happen? Right. You know? And then so, I think even listening to these records, it's like, man, something has got to be wrong here. Something has got, but it's like, it feels like, it feels good. I guess not. There's one song on the album, it's called Dream Ebony. And um, to me, it's probably my favorite song on the album. But that was a one take of me singing it. And one I remember- take, Jake. Yeah, and I remember recording it, and I cried at the end. Like I cried while recording it, and I listened. And I listened, and I was like, "Oh, this sounds terrible." <laughs> and I went, I was like, "I suck at music." I had to take a nap. I was so frustrated. I woke back up. I went back and looked, listened to it again, and I cried again. And I was like, "Okay, well, even if it sounds bad, every time I listen to this song, it makes me cry. There's got to be something there." Right. You know what I mean? And that's just what I'm saying. It's just like this disconnection from the mental, you thinking your way through it, all oh, this, that, and you just, how does it feel? Does it feel good? Does it feel right? How did it, cause that's, that's not a, it was not a mental thing. Like that, that's, that's, it's bigger than me. You all know right. what I mean? And so like, just this relinquishing of the nature of like, control, you know what I mean? And, and, and the premeditation and all this other stuff, this intellectual exercise that I had made making music. Towards a lot more of like a feeling process for me now. You know what I mean? I think with singing and with melodies and all sort of stuff, it's very instinctual. Mm -hmm. Like, whereas with rapping, with bars, it's like. Same shit. It's my rhyme scheme. Like, right, you gotta set it up all. Like, I can't remember last time I. I like, that, I think even if I did get back into rapping, it would have to be freestyle. You know what I mean? Like, I would have to, like, because that's really the process of writing is like a little bit like a sterilization. There, it's a disconnect, like this is the process, right? Right. So you stop in the middle to write this. It's a lot of these young do cats this. are doing right yeah. now, man. Yeah. It's pretty I, dope too, yeah. I like it. I mean, a lot of people, and I, I, mean, I, I thought that was shit. crazy. I, right. I could never do that, you know? But I, I think that that's, this, if you're recording, you're writing because you are documenting what you're saying, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? But if you're a recording artist, 
that's where you write. What's on paper is not the finished product. What's on wax is what's right. on recording. Right. The way you, you know flip I mean? it. So like even processes like that, I couldn't have come to that conclusion without a bit of sobriety, without a bit of space, and without like a degree of like, okay, I gotta I gotta risk it. You know what I mean? I gotta yeah. go in here and just oh. Well, and being confident in yourself, which yeah. you gain from, from, from knowing from, that it's coming from you, not from something else that you're bringing in. And I, I think that's, you know, I think that's there's a lot to be said about that. Is like slowly gaining confidence. You can hear on the album, like the reticence. Like I, feel I like hear it picking up. If you send it to me the way that it goes, I hear it like yeah. building up. You right. know what I mean? Right. To where like I could be like, I'd be thinking to myself like a lot of times, like maybe the first half is boring. Maybe the first, you know, but what I think is like, uh, but that's, that's you it's, thinking. it's real. Yeah. It's real. Like, I don't right. give a fuck. Like, right. this is the process. This is what happened. You know what I mean? This is an accurate documentation of what occurred. It would be faking the funk. Let me pump this up. Let me make this. If it's, if it's this or that or whatever flaws or shortcomings exist in this work, mm -hmm. it is still honest. It is still truthful. And that's more important than some preconceived notion of what good or bad is. Because I think that's the thing about it. It's like, if somebody could listen to this record and be like, I don't get it. I don't like it. They're just saying, I don't get it. I don't like it yet. Because the reality is, like, I've heard records. I didn't like it the first time. Now they're my favorite albums of all time. The record didn't change. Right. I changed. All these people are movable. To where, like, that fear of, like, maybe my friends won't like it. Maybe right. my friends won't <laughs> like it now, but I'm confident they will. I'm all right, all right. At it with time. That's one of the things you realize over time is like if you're consistent and you're doing something and the world is telling you, I don't get it, I'm not right. If you're consistent, mm -hmm. the world will come around. Right. But adversely, if you change to the world, that idea that you are the best thing that you believe in will never come to fruition. Will never be given its due credit. You gotta believe in it when nobody believes in it. Not for you real. gotta be the one man of faith in a world. Because I think here's the thing about it, man. The world is never right. It's the people in the world that are right or wrong. And the reality of the situation is nobody's permanently right or permanently wrong. So if somebody has an idea, somebody has a belief, the world may tell them they're wrong, but if they believe it and they keep fighting for it, eventually the world mm -hmm. will come to their agreement. And see it's right. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Right. And so it's like, that's the strength and faith I feel like a lot of times, even in doing the drugs, you are acquiescing. You're saying the world is right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And when actually you're right. You're right. You, know, you gotta have that faith. You gotta know. Hell yeah! Hell yeah! Hey, what's the name of the album again? Coming out. Faven. Faven. When's it dropping? Eleven twenty-three, November twenty-third. Oh, Faven is my friend. She's basically somebody. It's you know the the tagline for the album is dream pop for a black woman, particularly her because. Like I said, I didn't know why I was making music, but I also didn't know who I was making music for, right. right? And so, like, she was somebody who had had these early demos, and she was like, one day she asked me, she's like, what's up with this music? And I was like, what you mean? She's like, this is one of my favorite pieces of music of all time. You have to, and I was like, <sighs> And I was like, oh, I know who I'm making music for. You. Hell yeah. So she yep. gets the album, you know? Yep, still, yep. I still. And hey, you got a social media man where they can check out your yeah, music or yeah, all yeah, that the, good stuff? The IG is Obliterati Records, O-B-L-I-T-E-R-A-T-I -E Records. I'm about to get that because I don't IG. follow you on the gram. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was my name, but that's the label <laughs> I started just to put my shit out with. You know what I mean? But like um, the single is on Spotify and all that shit right now under my name, Yonas, Y-O-N-N-A-S, Macaroni. <laughs> uh, that's Don't spell song. it wrong. I know. I'm no, a jackass. No, no two S's. <laughs> Just two N's. Oh. Man, my bad, my bad. I know. That's, I don't do it anymore. Actually, go. every time I now when I was looking, I was like, make sure you spell that shit right. <laughs> wow, double N A. Double N. Double, <laughs> double N. Yeah, I got it. I got yeah. it. I got it. Nah, you know what though? Fucking. Um. I mean, when it come out, I want to come back. You know what I mean? Oh, for sure. Yeah, let's do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, def we yeah. should definitely get we're another. Gonna, one we're gonna in. talk. We're gonna make some tight shit happen, bro. And we got the space to make it happen. Yeah, so nah, nah. we are gonna have the little first mini concert right here with your boy right here. You want to okay. do that shit? Uh, little tiny desk in here. Uh, yeah. I'll do a tiny desk in this one. I get the band together. We got witnesses. 
And two, three months is going down uh, here. With your I'll bring a band in this mother. Yeah, we're let's do, do it, bro. Hot, bro. You can, yeah. I'm off weed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's do no it. No drugs. No if pookies. You come with drugs, you get yeah. <laughs> No pookies, nigga. He's Put like the pookie that. there. <laughs> nah, um, uh, what was I going to say? You know, I mean, down. I think part of the thing, too, with performing and all that shit is like, I really just want to get the music out. And For I feel sure. like part of performing and all that shit is like, that could get in the way. I just want to market online. I just want to make videos. I just want to make... And then when there's an audience, when there people want to see a show... Bless them. I'll bless them. But I'm not about to do that. I'm opening up for all of them. Yeah. 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 On your terms. That's what on it's all about. Terms. You know what I'm saying? On my fucking terms. Yeah, that's what it's about now. Man. Hell yeah, bro. Well, right. shit, man. Any any final thoughts? Any last scenes? Nah, man. I really appreciate this. I'm really excited. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, like it's been a long time. You know, I'm excited to get back out there. And that's why I felt like if I'm going to do that, I got to start. You know what I mean? Because, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, you really got to center the people who center you. And you got to be, you got to. Like, my dad used to always say, bro, I used to perform shows and I'd be, like, rapping and the people in front would be all into it. And real it. quick, he would be at all of them. I know. Mm. My dad is a real one. But um, I, the people in the back, I'd be like, put your hands up, I'm mad. And he'd be like, why are you worried about the people in the back who don't care? What about the people in the front who do? And I, that's that's a life lesson. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's why I'm here. Because Joe Thunder was in the front. You know what I mean? Yeah. Elvis was in the front. Yeah. So... I got to center Let's y'all go. first. Let's I appreciate it. you, bro. And like I said, we're appreciate gonna, you for sure. For have sure. you back and we'll do it again. Make this shit happen, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I promise mm. you. I promise you. Tiny desk. Tiny <laughs> yeah, desk. Make Joe, it Joe Thunder's first here. tiny desk. Ah, right here. Let's do it. Ah, all right, y'all better get your tickets in advance. You feel me? All right. Well, shit, there you have it. Another banger for you, man. The homie Jonas. Yeah, killing appreciate shit. y'all. Your boy Elvis Freshly, we got Juan Yo, in the building, you know. we got Crook, your boy Joe Thunder, find us on all platforms. We are out of here. Peace. Peace. Peace.